Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Steve McCoy and I'm a physical therapist and a certified athletic trainer. I'll be presenting today on NEHAB XP in an athletic training program. Uh, a couple of things as far as disclosures before we get started. Uh, I am the owner of Achieve Solutions Incorporated uh, with a group of other therapists. Uh, that company in and of itself has a few different components, uh, one of which is Achieve Therapy Solutions. That's a contract uh, portion of our business, uh, contracting rehab services with uh, long-term care facilities uh, and brain injury centers. Uh, Achieve Physical Therapy and Sports Medicine is our outpatient orthopedic venue, and Achieve Education Solutions is where we do some of our uh, continuing education courses. Most of my practice uh, right now, as far as what I do uh, clinical practice wise, is outpatient orthopedics and sports medicine uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, today I am presenting on behalf of Neurotech and I do serve on the Neurotech Advisory Board as well. The objectives for today when we're talking about how to use uh, neuromuscular electrical stim uh, in knee injury care, uh, developing an understanding of the role of electrotherapy in the treatment of various knee pathologies. I'd also like to talk a little bit about how we can identify how NEHAB can effectively facilitate quadriceps strengthening in a variety of different types of knee injuries, recognize how NEHAB can provide pre and post surgical pain relief, and also examine the clinical research that's out there right now on NEHAB multipath technology and how that can facilitate a faster recovery from ACL reconstructive surgery. Uh, just a quick quote uh, before we get started here. Uh, Earl Wilson uh, made the comment that uh, Benjamin Franklin may have discovered electricity, uh, but it was the man who invented the meter who actually ended up making the money. A little bit of history of electrotherapy before we get into some of the specifics about NEHAB. Uh, the use of electrical uh, energy for medical purposes has been documented for thousands of years, uh, encompassing all kinds of different uh, what you might call devices. Uh, the Greeks, Romans, uh, examples uh, used different types of aquatic animals to deal with injuries. Uh, English, German, and Italian researchers oftentimes study the electrical currents on various parts of the body, but in particularly conditions like paralysis are all well documented in history. Uh, electrical stim use in the medical profession became far more commonly accepted in the 1960s. Uh, research had been conducted at that time and moving forward on various types of electrical currents such as Russian and interferential current. Uh, technology advances over the course of the years have allowed us to use more small portable devices including home type e-stim units. When I have questions about electrotherapy, I know who to go to. Uh, my friend Buzz Lightyear here is an expert in electromagnetic energy, uh, so he's a good resource for me. Uh, some of the basic applications of electrotherapy in a clinical setting, uh, sensory stimulation, motor stimulation, and ion movement are the three general areas that we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll start off talking just a little bit about the ionic movement. Uh, the example here would be creating an electrical field uh, in the biological tissues to stimulate or alter the overall healing process. Uh, for example, uh, with that galvanic stim, uh, you can change the ionic flow, uh, try and help with the swelling and perhaps uh, an acute injury in a joint. Another example is creating an electrical field on the skin tissue surfaces, trying to drive those ions into and through the skin barrier. Uh, the example, of course, from that would be iontophoresis. Motor stimulation and sensory stimulation. When we talk about motor stimulation, and that's the bulk of what we'll talk about today, uh, stimulating nerve and muscle uh, to create a contraction of the, the actual muscle tissues. A uh, classic example of that, of course, would be Russian stim. And then sensory stimulation, uh, modulating the pain using the gate theory. Uh, we've all been uh, using TENS units for numerous years, and that's a classic example of how that's done. Specifically, when we talk about muscle contraction, uh, we want to hit a few different areas with that. Uh, muscle re-education, muscle pump, uh, the retardation of muscle atrophy, muscle strengthening, as well as increasing the patient's range of motion. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about each of these subcategories here real quick. Uh, muscle re-education, uh, this would be used, used after an injury or after some type of a surgical procedure, basically provides a stimulation of those motor nerves and helps to facilitate the contraction of the muscle. Uh, this helps to then help with the sensory input and reintegrating the patient's voluntary muscle movement control patterns, something that oftentimes can be affected by, say, a long tourniquet time in a surgical procedure. With the muscle pump, uh, just like we use ankle pumps and other types of, of movement to try and facilitate uh, the tissue flow or the flow of uh, items through the, the body, whether it be the, through the circulatory system uh, or through the lymphatic system, we can actually use uh, e-stim devices to help with regular muscle contractions to move that blood and, and other th things through the nervous and lymphatic channels. 
Retarding muscle atrophy, uh, we want to try and maintain muscle tissue as best we can uh, after any type of an injury or after a surgical procedure. Uh, using it for muscle contraction helps us to reproduce both the physical and the chemical uh, events that are associated with a voluntary muscle contraction and that in turn helps to assist with maintaining normal muscle function. For muscle strengthening, obviously patients who have weakness, uh, we can incorporate it for that, uh, as well as patients who are suffering from some type of muscle denervation. Helping with the range of motion, uh, not oftentimes used, uh, particularly in more of an athletic type setting, uh, but can be used uh, to try and move a joint through the full range of motion, uh, to facilitate range of motion in a joint and help to decrease uh, joint contractures. Uh, when we look at functional mobility, that can be a very helpful tool. As far as using e-stim such as TENS uh, in regards to pain, uh, the sensory stimulus providing three different types of mechanism is how this works. Uh, one would be the gate control theory, second would be the central biasing theory, and then the last one would be the opiate pain control theory. Most of you are probably familiar with the gate control theory. Uh, basically messages uh, from the peripheral nervous system are transferred back to the brain in an electrical chemical nature and when we use a TENS unit we're using a non-noxious stimulus to try to block that painful afferent activity. Uh, some examples of that, I actually had uh, one of these happen to me this morning. Uh, getting out of bed, the chair that was in the room actually was a little bit further away from the desk than I thought and managed to stub my toe. Uh, those are examples again when you start to grab that or you start to shake your hand after it's hit by a hammer uh, or using that gate control theory to try and shut off the pain response. The central biasing theory is a little less understood, uh, but that stimulation of the smaller nerve fibers and the pain receptors at the peripheral sites for a very short period of time, that in turn affects the descending neurons and that closes the gate basically at the spinal cord level. The last one on here is the opiate pain control theory. Uh, in essence, that amounts to the stimulation of sensory nerves and releasing the endorphins and the enkephalins. Uh, the runner that I have on there, uh, that's that runner's high that we get. Uh, I spoke at a conference in uh, January, actually was at a ski conference uh, for athletic training and sports medicine, and I asked the audience as to uh, if anyone had uh, experienced that runner's high before. No one managed to raise their hand, uh, but I guess that it is out there for those of you that do a lot of running. Talk a little bit specifically now about the Nehab XP device and how it incorporates both uh, the motor and the sensory. Uh, it basically allows you to do that motor stimulus for muscle contraction and allow the TENS for pain relief all in one clinical device. So we're looking at a situation where you don't have to use different types of units and stuff to accomplish your goals. Some of the key product features here that we want to talk about in regards to the Nehab XP, uh, it has a thigh wrap garment. Uh, large anatomical conductive gel pads. Uh, we're going to touch on both of those things here in just a minute. Uh, the multi-path technology, which is probably the key to how this device is different from everything else on the market right now. The dual channel for optimal joint stability and targeted muscle contraction. And then also it has a patient compliance monitor. Uh, I'm sure all of your patients are very, very compliant, unlike all of mine. Uh, the thigh wrap garment, uh, it's very easy to take on and off. Uh, it takes the guesswork out of where to place the electrodes uh, when you're utilizing the device. Uh, basically, it helps to make sure that everything's in the right place uh, and has good contact when it's placed onto the, the patient. The patented anatomically shaped gel pads, uh, they're large pads which allow a greater tolerance to the intensity of the uh, higher stim. Uh, this also helps with more muscle fiber recruitment. Both of those factors together are super important because it leads to greater patient compliance. It's easy to use and it's going to feel a lot more comfortable for them than traditional stim. The controller for the device uh, has an LCD screen with nine preset programs. Uh, those nine preset programs can be very helpful again with setup uh, for patients. Uh, the patient compliance monitor that's on part of the device helps you to track the number of treatments that the patient is using when they're using the device on their own, the treatment time, the how long they have it on, the intensity of the stimulus used uh, so you know how much they're turning the unit up. Uh, as well as then helping the clinician take that information and monitor and adjust their home program accordingly. Here's a picture of the actual device itself. Uh, you can see actually the conductive pads as they're placed onto the garment. The garment has Velcro tabs that you can strap onto the patient, makes it easy to apply, uh, and then a small handheld unit that's uh, adjustable when the patient is using the device. We'll talk a little bit about the science behind this now. Uh, an independent study was uh, performed on the actual device itself. 
Uh, they use thermography to demonstrate how there's greater muscle fiber recruitment using the NEHAB compared to conventional stim. Uh, you can see on the picture here actually that the one on the right hand side, uh, would be the left hand actually if you're looking at it, but the right hand side of the patient uh, had greater blood flow uh, and response than the actual conventional stim. Uh, it's important to note on this too that the garment itself was not on the patient uh, when they were doing this. Uh, it was just the actual electrodes, uh, so there wasn't any extra factors and stuff associated with it. The multi-path technology, again, is the key to how this unit is different than other uh, E-STEM units. It mimics the body's natural firing response pattern. Uh, basically what this does is it starts with a stimulus of the VMO. Uh, that VMO contraction is critical to begin followed by the vastus lateralis. Eventually the vastus lateralis is then released and then there's a subsequent uh, release of the VMO. Uh, what that does is it actually puts the patellofemoral mechanics in a little better alignment, helps with a good contraction of the area uh, with less patellofemoral issues. When we look at the NEHAB multipath technology, again, it's also recruiting in a random pattern. It's not the consistent pattern that you may see with other types of STEM units. This allows for improved muscle response because there's a less fatigue factor. There decreases the amount of fatigue as the person goes through more and more contraction cycles. There was a clinical research study that was performed on this uh, product that was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine uh, in June of 2011. Uh, the title of that study was The Effectiveness of Supplementing a Standard Rehabilitation Program with Superimposed Neuromuscular Electrical Stimulation After ACL Reconstruction. And if you can say that five times fast, then you're pretty talented. The study highlights uh, basically the objective of the study was to uh, compare the effects of adding uh, neuromuscular electrical stim uh, to a standard rehabilitation program following ACL reconstruction. The study itself was actually conducted at the Center for Knee and Foot Surgery Sports Traumatology in Heidelberg, Germany. Some of the highlights of the study, uh, there was 131 patients that took, place, or took part in this actual study. 96 of those patients completed the entire process that needed to be included in the study. Uh, it was a six month study including all of the follow up testing. 96 of those folks made it all the way through. There were three groups uh, that were divided up. One was a control group. That group received standard physical therapy treatment only. Group two actually included physical therapy along with standard electrotherapy, uh, the common units that were available. Group three then had physical therapy services along with the NEHAB unit. The study protocol included all subjects following the accelerated rehab protocol uh, that was initiated immediately post-surgical. Uh, the two groups that had the neuromuscular electrical stim applied actually started on either the third or fourth day post-op and then they conducted three 20-minute sessions five times a week for 12 weeks with their STEM unit, whether it be the actual standard unit or the NEHAB unit. Voluntary muscle uh, contraction of the quadriceps was asked to be performed along with the actual E-STEM unit, so they were doing it with the STEM unit at the same time. The control group was actually then instructed to perform quadriceps contractions on their own following that same time schedule that the other two groups were utilizing. Post-op checks were conducted at 6 weeks, 12 weeks, and then at 6 months, or 24 weeks. This is the setup that was used for the conventional E-STEM group, uh, typical as to what you might see with a uh, two-channel E-STEM unit uh, to the quadriceps. Uh, you can see how that might be applied. When we look at the knee half setup, again, you can see the actual thigh garment that was wrapped around uh, the surface of the uh, quadriceps, uh, and then the actual flow pattern of the electric electrical current uh, is included on that slide as well. The study protocol looked at the following goals from physical therapy. Uh, the primary goal early on was to restore range of motion, increase the patient's extensor strength at the knee, enhance their overall functional ability, and eventually reintegrate them into everyday activities. The study protocol included both subjective and objective measures that were looked at. Uh, the values here that we looked at were isokinetic strength tests of the knee extensors, a shuttle run, uh, one leg hop test, as well as clinically validated questionnaires that were filled out and a patient diary uh, that kept track of what they were doing. Uh, this is an example of the NEHAB unit uh, in work on an ACL reconstruction. Uh, it's one of my patients. Uh, I actually uh, had a chance to work with him. Uh, high level athlete, uh, tore his ACL following his junior year in high school. I uh, had qualified previously three times for state track and field. Uh, tore it in the summer during uh, 
football workouts. I uh, went underwent uh, reconstructive surgery and the physical therapy rehab program and subsequently returned to the state track and field mate uh, this last spring in three different events instead of the one event that he had previously been doing and I uh, was recruited to uh, perform or to uh, compete both in college football and in college track and field. Uh, some of the study results here to hit the highlights, uh, the st statistical analysis from this actual study showed that uh, the difference in test performance between the standard uh, neuromuscular stim unit and the control group was not significant in any test measure that was looked at. However, the difference was significant in every test measure when you compared the NEHAB to the other interventions that were used. And that sensitivity again was a p-value of 0.05. Some of the highlights of the study here then, uh, isokinetic testing, when we looked at 90 degrees per second and 180 degrees per second, the NEHAB actually restored the knee extension strength before the 12-week mark of uh, the patient's rehab program. The other two groups were not at their preoperative strength levels until week 24, so again, twice as fast. Isokinetic testing, when we looked at, again, 90 and 180 degrees per second, comparing the injured and uninjured leg uh, for knee extension strength, the NEHAB actually had the non-surgical leg comparative with the surgical leg before the 12-week mark, while the other two groups did not attain the actual strength of the uninjured leg, even by the last testing values that were taken at week 24. When we looked at the results for the shuttle run and the one leg hot, uh, the NEHAB group actually achieved preoperative values right around week six. Uh, one was a little before that, the other test was just around that, uh, which was actually twice as fast as the values for the other two groups uh, when it came to the results as to those two particular functional tests. Finally, the NEHAB group also showed a higher rate of compliance uh, than the conventional e-STEM group, which again is, is very precious in these days when we have fewer and fewer clinical visits with our uh, clientele. Uh, we want to make sure that compliance outside of the clinical environment is going to be a, a, a key component to their success. The NEHAB group also returned to work faster. Uh, the control group uh, got back into their work situation at about 3.67 weeks. The neural stim group, the typical stim group, was at about 3.88, while the NEHAB group was back in 2.7 weeks. Another study that's out there right now is published online actually March of uh, this year, 2012. Uh, it was entitled Rehabilitation Following Meniscal Repair uh, by John Cavanaugh and Sarah Killian. Uh, that incorporated NEHAB in a progressive protocol review looking at uh, different types of protocols following meniscal surgery procedures. The newest version of the NEHAB, one of the key things uh, I wanted you to take out of this as well, uh, in addition to the contraction tissue, uh, contraction of the tissues and the success with that, uh, is that the new, rehab, the new NEHAB unit also includes a TENS unit. This allows the patient to receive the benefits of pain relief in addition to the e-STEM uh, for muscle contraction. Uh, this convenience also will help again with patient compliance, which is critical to success. Some of the other things that are out there as far as potential clinical uses for this device, uh, total knee arthroplasty, knee replacement type uh, situations. Uh, we've talked a little bit about ligamentous repairs already. Uh, patellofemoral syndrome, I think, is going to be a key uh, use for this unit moving forward. Uh, we have an unending population uh, around the globe of patellofemoral pain syndrome patients, and, and I, I can see that this device is clearly going to be successful in helping those patients uh, get back into their activities. Patellar dislocation, uh, some of the open reduction internal fixation folks, uh, as well as osteoarthritic ones. Uh, I wanted to comment on that too, that in some of our clinical facilities where we see uh, some of our geriatric population, uh, we're incorporating this unit to try and enhance the functional ability for these folks even to go from a seated position to a standing position uh, after their quadriceps have shut off over the years due to some of the osteoarthritic changes in their joints. Uh, and We're having some good success with that already clinically. Who else is out there using uh, NEHAB? Uh, in addition to a lot of the football players that uh, may be around uh, from just about every level uh, of competition, there's a numer uh, numerous other world-class athletes. Uh, Phil Jones, uh, Manchester United and England footballer. David Wallace, uh, Munster in Ireland uh, rugby player. Christopher Dean, who's an Olympic ice skater. Uh, Zoe Gillings, an Olympic snowboarder. Uh, and David Knight uh, is a world-class uh, motorcycle enduro champion, uh, all of which have made use of, of the NEHAB XP product. Uh, and had some great success with it. I'm not so sure about uh, how long Tigger's tail is going to hold up or what use his knees might have for the NEHAB device in the future, but we're on uh, speaking terms, so hopefully he'll know how to get into contact with us. I did include some uh, references on here from some of the things that were in today's presentation. 
Uh, and then I'll finish up this slide here. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, I actually had a chance to be here in town a couple years ago. I uh, took my kids out to see who at that point was their favorite Cardinal, Albert Pujols. Uh, Ironically, uh, it was 107 degrees for that night game at the first pitch that night, and the temperature forecast for uh, later this week here in St. Louis is to top the 100 degree mark again. So uh, thank you again for your time this morning. Uh, got a few minutes. If there's any questions and stuff about any of the products, we can certainly address that as well. Thank you.